once again, uh, my name is Mohammed Muzumdar, and I'm going to talk about uh, uh, a project that I have been working with my students. Uh, so uh, these are my students. You can see that uh, they did the work. I'm just basically advertising their work. So they did. Uh, uh, we spent around the year from the grant from matrons, and uh, I'm going to talk about. Uh, um, a microsensor uh, wireless sensor uh, platform development, which is uh, in the, my left hand, which is this one. So I'm going to talk about this and the capability of, of this one. So let me, I mean, uh, we live in an urban area, and uh, I think uh, uh, this slide say that uh, we don't like something that we face every day. So, I mean, nobody likes it, but we have to face every day. Now, obviously, uh, living in a smarter world, uh, we can make some interesting or uh, smarter time. So, uh, for example, you like to go from uh, any places. Uh, for example, I'm coming from Orange County in this morning. Before coming to here, I was seeing that which way to go, which, which one to basically take a route. Uh, uh, which uh, way to take a look. Now, you can see that uh, having real-time traffic, um, you can see that which way to go, even though, for example, uh, from these two places, uh, you take the longer route that takes shorter time. So normally, you know, who like to take the long or longer tr uh, route? But you can see that that basically saving you time. Now, uh, how? Now, now the question is that uh, uh, obviously the Garmin, TomTom, and others uh, who has the capability of the real-time uh, traffic integration, they can give you the answer that which way to go from place A to place B. Now the question is that uh, how exactly does Google Map, Garmin, TomTom know that uh, how clogged the highway is on your way to office or home or vacation places and so on? How they know that? So normally, the answer is pretty simple. Um, they get the data. So they get the data from uh, several sources. So uh, several, for example, their commercial uh, traffic data provider, like uh, Indrix, uh, Teleartos, Altos, and here. Mm, so Indrix is, is uh, basically uh, right now uh, funded by Google, so Google uh, dump uh, lots of money to them to basically provide better uh, data to them. And uh, Department of Transportation, they also provide this information, uh, and also a state agency like Caltrans and so on. So these are the uh, entity, they provide the traffic data. Now, the question is that how they collect it? how they collect this data for you. So uh, there are several ways to collect them. Obviously, not several, there are many ways. So I just listed the major uh, way to do it. So uh, Google initially started to take it from the mobile companies. Because for example, you, everyone right now, I mean, in a smarter world, everyone has a smartphone, everyone carrying a phone. So no, it's very hard to find a person without a phone. And um, the whatever carrier that you have, T-Mobile or, for example, Verizon and so on, your carrier can exactly tell you where are you right now within, uh, within a meter. So they can exactly tell you where are you right now. So now they provide this information to Google, and Google basically try to see that who is in the roadway and, and so on, and provide uh, uh, the traffic information. So, so this is one way of, of, of doing things. Now, uh, the other way also uh, basically widely used is road sensors. So there are the uh, Caltrans Department of Transportation. They implant uh, the sensor uh, underneath the pavement. And that's what we are going to talk about mostly today, about the road sensors, and especially one kind of sensors. Uh, which is called inductive loop. So I'm going to uh, explain about the inductive loop a bit and see that how we can uh, basically, I mean, um, optimize the uh, design and system that has been basically used, we are using for years, uh, decade, uh, and so on. 
cameras that can also in the surface way, the ca you will see the cameras, they are basically mounting on, the, on top of the uh, lights, okay? And even uh, using aircraft, that uh, these are the sources uh, the companies like entities like they, they use to collect the raw data. Now, once they collect the data, uh, Garmin, for example, uh, TomTom, they uh, collect, they get this information by using FM or HD radio. So, uh, for example, your uh, GPS, uh, it has a radio receiver. It can receive the traffic data. That's why it can tell that where is the traffic right now. They are generating the data. They send it by using the radio frequency uh, in the locality, and then uh, your uh, uh, GPS can uh, find the best route for you based on this information. So, I mean, this is the basically a bit of short introduction or uh, short storyline about that how you get, uh, I mean, uh, the best route from a place A to place B. Now, let's talk about the uh, road sensor that, uh, that's the main concentration of this uh, talk. So, the widely used road sensor is inductive loop. So inductive loop, normally it is widely used in surface road. Now, uh, I'm going to show you something in next time if you are not familiar with the inductive loop. If you, uh, I mean, if you're just in the surface road, you, you'll see and you'll, oh, this is the inductive loop. So if you see in the middle of the road, in the center, there is a cut like this. So a bit of rectangular, this shape, this, so these are nothing but the inductive loop. So I'm going to talk about a bit uh, details, uh, what is the inductive, inductive loop and how does it work. So uh, the purpose of this loop, so they're underneath the pavement, and the purpose of uh, this loop, inductive loop, is basically uh, detect the traffic. So uh, it can basically detect the uh, vehicle, so there is a vehicle on top of this loop or not. So that's basically the purpose of it. Now, these loops generate a magnetic field that operates a frequency typically less than one kilohertz. Now, these are the, uh, this is the technology that uh, Caltrans or transportation industry, they are using for decade and decade. So this is one of the uh, the proven way to collect the sensor data, uh, collect the road data, uh, traffic data, especially in the surface road. And these are huge. I mean, huge means, I mean, that's for example, in the, for example, a, uh, for the detecting the larger vehicle, you need to have a, a loop, so inductive loop, so the four feet by eight feet, six to eight, six to 12. So, I mean, these are, these are pretty big. And for the small size of loop, uh, it could be two by five, three by six, six by six feet. So uh, that can detect the smaller vehicle. So uh, nothing less than, for example, you can see that five feet or six feet, so in, uh, in one dimension. So these are uh, the inductive loop that uh, uh, transportation industry implants underneath the pavement. Now, uh, what is the physics behind it? I'm just going to basically very shortly give you some idea of the, the physics behind it. So the physics behind it is uh, this is the earth magnetic uh, uh, field. So uh, you know that our earth is a big magnet, isn't it? So I mean there is a magnetic field here. You, fi you find this magnetic field in everywhere. So this is basically a simplistic view of, the, of this magnetic field. Now, uh, any uh, ferocious material like your car have a dipole uh, magnetic signature like this. So this is like this. So now, when they both come together, when they both come together, you'll see an anomaly or disturbance in the magnetic field. So uh, when there is a car that basically blend with this uh, magnetic field, art magnetic field, and makes an anomaly like this, and this we can say that there is some metal here. So for example, uh, if we have a, a car passing on, for example, here, and you'll see that if uh, we, we can see a distortion here. So based on the distortion uh, of the magnetic field, 
the inductive loop uh, basically detect the vehicle. So it produce a uh, induct in a, a loop, and whenever uh, a vehicle passes on top of that magnetic field, it make a distortion, and based on that distortion then it can basically detect it. Now, I mean, very simply, nowadays, uh, I had a 1996 uh, Audi. I mean, that has very heavy. Compared to right now, if you buy any, any car, I mean, that's basically, that's what uh, Professor was saying. That's very light, isn't it? So what is the, what they are trying to do is r removing metal as mass as they can. So obviously, uh, this, uh, if you have, I mean, by somehow we have complete uh, plastic car. So, I mean, there is no metal. So, this technology will not work. Okay? So, this, this works when there is metal there. But obviously, that's uh, the, uh, the technique that we have. We have, we have shown that even with the RC car, our technique works. So, you don't have to need big metal to uh, implement this methodology. So, so far, um, so what is the advantage of the inductive loop? Why, for example, Caltrans uh, uh, Department of Transportation ex uh, spend around millions of dollars to maintain and install these loops? So first of all, uh, they can detect ferocious uh, uh, object very precisely. So if there is a uh, metallic object, it can detect it very precisely. And secondly, uh, it's uh, immune uh, from environmental effect like weather, temperature, uh, or terrain vari uh, variation. So these are very good. So you like to install something that works. So this works. But there is downside here. So the downside is that uh, if you like to install it, it's very expensive to install, and it's uh, also expensive to maintain. Because uh, oftentimes you see that you know they are basically uh, digging the road, and at that time it's somebody basically dig the road. For example, another agency, and they can destroy the loop, and they have to basically cut the loop again and so on. And uh, you can see the three dollar meaning is that it's pretty pretty expensive so to uh, install and maintain them, and also. Uh, relatively significant power source. So you need a power source to uh, create that inductive loop. So there is a power source needed that uh, need to be connected to the inductive loop. So we need to have power supply to the loop. And obviously, uh, it takes larger area, so uh, around the 10 feet of, uh, of a size. So, uh, so, th so that's basically uh, so in, in today's world, uh, something is smart need to be what? Small, isn't it? So uh, smart things need to be small and so on. So that's what we are trying to do. We're trying to have the same functionality but making into a small package. So that's the motivation of this. So this was a proposed model, uh, proposed architecture that I was proposing in a year back. and. Uh, does it exist? Yes, it exists. So, I mean, there is company, they are producing uh, and selling uh, these short of things to the transportation agency. Uh, so, obviously, I, I'll explain that what uh, challenge that we have taken, uh, what is the interesting part that we are, we are dealing with compared to this uh, industry. But let me introduce that, what is the alternative way to uh, get the sensor, get the data, but not by using the inductive loop. So now, by using the MEM sensors, by which is just three millimeter of a size. So compared to the 10 uh, feet, the sensor becomes three millimeter. And that, has, that sensor has the capability to detect the, uh, the magnetic signature of, uh, of uh, for a ferocious material. So uh, you need a sensor like this. So this is basically that sensor. And then uh, you need a, uh, we need a microcontroller, small microcontroller that can read the data from the sensor. And that microcontroller also need a radio because to wirelessly communicate with the uh, with the ECU, uh, that means the uh, station where you are collecting the data. So that's what we have here. So this cell, this small cell, 
has a microcontroller with the RF code. RF means uh, radio frequency that can communicate with wirelessly. So you don't have to cut. You don't have to cut the road. So like uh, if we go back here, you can see that we have to cut it and we have to route the power. So you have to basically cut it and pull the power here. So we don't have to do it right now. So this is the good thing here. So here dotted line means this is a wireless communication. So there is, you don't have to dig the uh, road. And these are, as I, as I have shown here, so this is the first prototype that we have built. So this is a size like this. So compared to the 10 feet. So this is the gross size. I mean, we can make it a bit quarter. Um, I mean, uh, size of a quarter. So this will be the, uh, uh, the system. Now, why do we need two of them? Uh, if we like to detect the speed of a vehicle, then you need two. One is good for detection and the classification. The reason we have put two in the same lane, because we like to also, if you like to uh, detect the speed and so on. So now they communicate with a ECU here. ECU is, means uh, electronics communication unit. And uh, now existing inductive loop require to have a power supply. Now, you can think about, I mean, uh, uh, in US we have, I mean, millions of miles of highway uh, routing all over the places. So if you like to basically implant inductive loop, you have to power supply on, on that place. If you don't have the power supply, this loop doesn't work because it needs power. So uh, what we are trying that uh, we can use the solar uh, cell here in this, uh, without using the uh, basically the uh, direct power supply because we don't need power here. So we just need power to uh, make this small uh, ECU to uh, run its operation. So this, then this is you can basically send uh, data to the, uh, to the commercial uh, entity or for example, the uh, um, Caltrans or Department of Transportation and so on. And then they can send you to, to your GPS to understand the, uh, understand the traffic. So this is uh, the, I mean, the architectural view of this whole thing. Now, if you uh, compare it with the existing uh, traditional inductive loop, so this is what we see here. You can see that you have to have built a loop, and then these are physical wear. So wear, uh, power wear, so that you have to power cable, that you have to run through to produce or build this uh, inductive loop. And this is the way. They are doing right now, still right now. Most of the uh, Caltrans district, they, they use, they implant this sort of system on the surface road. So that's what they do. So right now, if we, uh, I mean, if we move to this smarter planet or smarter system, that will be like this. We have a credit card-like uh, component here. That's what I'm showing here. And you don't have to cut it. So they work wirelessly uh, and then they can send it to the ECU here, and uh, we can get the data. So I mean, uh, that looks good. But uh, if you don't have the power underneath of the pavement, are you going to uh, redig the hole every couple of days, every 10 or 15 days? Your job is gone. I mean, those <laughs> who is going to basically implement it, uh, his job is gone. Because uh, this is not possible. You cannot just replace the battery. So. Uh, we also trying to do energy scavenging because whenever, for example, uh, your vehicle is passing on the road, you are, uh, you are basically pressuring the road with the large metal. So we tried also see that how to do energy scavenging from there so that you don't ha uh, have to basically replace it. it uh, get the recharge from the pressure of the car okay. and it can run years after years. So obviously that we have to solve, otherwise with the lithium battery, well, I mean, the smartest algorithm you can come up with that can run a year, two years, and then, then you have to basically re -dig it. So we have to basically find another solution. Thank you. So now uh, I'm going to uh, touch a bit of uh, uh, the technology that we are using. So as I told you that uh, in this whole diagram, uh, the sensor board, we have uh, two important things here, a microcontroller and a, a sensor, AMR sensor. So 
Uh, so this AMR sensor, which is called uh, magnetoresistive sensors, uh, is a size of three millimeter. And what they have, basically a Wiston uh, breeze variable resistor network that changes resistance uh, with respect of the changes of magnetic field. And it provides the same advantage to inductive loop technology without the power uh, and the area disadvantage. So as you can see, so these are just uh, three millimeter of size. And the power consumption of this uh, uh, sensor is around 200 microampere. So it's pretty, pretty uh, low in budget. Now, the microcontroller that we are using from, uh, sorry, so this one from Honeywell. And the uh, microcontroller that we are using is from uh, Texas Instrument. And it is a microprocessor uh, that has, this is a, is a system on chip. System on chip means it combines multiple things together. So it has a radio and a processor integrated all together. So it can process and it can communicate. So that's basically we need to make it smarter. Now, once we develop the uh, system, now the hardest part is the algorithm. So to uh, run uh, our uh, vehicle classification, that's what we are trying to do with a smarter move. So that's what we are trying to do. And you need to explain what a vehicle classification is. There may be I people see. here who don't know. Oh, uh, we, we, we'll, we'll go to that place a bit later. Thank you. So I mean, uh, the main idea of the vehicle classification is that uh, uh, we like to understand that what kind of vehicle is passing on the road. So right now, you can see the traffic. I mean, traffic is good. But we like to basically, especially those who are policy makers, they like to see that how many freight are moving so that they can have better policy to uh, basically for the roadway. So, and, and there are many other applications and so on. So it's like counting, uh, not only counting the, uh, the traffic, but also understand the type of it. So that's the main uh, concentration of my research. So we, I'm going to show and explain how we are going to do it. And the, uh, the weapon here is the machine learning. So we, we are trying to use the machine learning method to classify the vehicles. Now, if you hear about the machine learning, that's basically a buzzword nowadays. And the Google, uh, Amazon, Facebook, they do machine learning. And they have hundreds of thousands of servers. Uh, and they, they have used computation to do machine learning. So now, uh, how we are going to do machine learning here? I mean, it doesn't have enough power. It doesn't have enough computation and so on. So that's what I'm going to explain here about the machine learning. So uh, before going to a bit further, uh, I like to explain a bit uh, uh, the basics of the uh, machine learning. So this is useful when uh, you have set of data in larger uh, enough that uh, human observation for extracting feature uh, becomes impractical. So when you have large amount of data and you like to basically um, extract the pattern from the data and it becomes almost impractical. At that time, she likes to see some uh, machine learning methods typically used in the field of data mining. And uh, normally, uh, it used pattern recognition uh, for, as a set of rules. So now, how are we going to use the machine learning in, uh, in our research? So in very simply, uh, simplified way, I can tell that We'll collect the data from the AMR, that means uh, sensor, the sensor that we are using, the three millimeter size of sensor. And we are going to see that what magnetic signature uh, it produces. And we are going to do some um, pattern recognition methods to understand the which type of vehicle uh, it is. So this is what we have done. So yeah, we are not fortunate enough to basically go to four or five dig it and then put our system there. But we did uh, have a test set up in our lab to, uh, to test that whether it works or not. Okay? So this is what we have. Now we have seven vehicles. I mean, that's what you can see. I mean, 
Now, in respect of ferociousness, I mean, the metal they have, they don't have that much of difference. So, I mean, uh, they don't have that much of metallic components. I mean, compared to, for example, if you drive a sedan and somebody drive a truck, there are lots of difference of metal, isn't it? Here, classification will be easy or hard. It will be hard because they are almost uh, same. Or the, the, the classification will be much, much harder uh, in the real life compared to here because these things are small. They doesn't have that much of uh, uh, metal. So if we can solve it here, most likely this will work in the street. So this is our hope, and this is basically our postulate or theorem. So that's, so that's why you have seven vehicles that we have purchased to uh, run these tests, and they are basically in very different size. So this is the track that we have developed in our lab. It is around seven feet. So you can see that here to here is seven feet. And we have put two sensors underneath this, uh, uh, this uh, white sheet. So there's a sensor one here and sensor two here. Apparently, they are around four meter distance. So that's basically the distance between the uh, two of them. And what you see is basically underneath of this sheet. So this is the track. Uh, this is the track. And if you basically go behind the uh, white sheet, you'll see that our sensor system is basically attached underneath it. Okay. So this is the test setup that we have. Now, what we did is basically uh, uh, to start the machine learning, uh, learning process at first requires some gathering of data. So that's what we have to do at first. So we collected data from each vehicle, around uh, seven vehicles, 350 runs on two sensors. And it was around 700 samples for seven vehicles. So around 100 um, data set for each of these vehicle. So what is the meaning of that? That 100 times we know how the magnetic signature will look like if it runs on top of a sensor. Okay? So we have, for example, a same car running on a sensor 100 times. We know that how does it look like? How the magnetic signature will look like? So we have, we have collected that. Now, now, we are going to do a simple uh, learning, uh, 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 machine learning algorithm based on decision tree. So this is the, the, the simplest machine learning algorithm that you can use in a, this sort of uh, device. Because this doesn't have enough memory and the power. So you need to basically be ca careful so that you, know, you don't know, uh, run out the, uh, basically the power. So decision tree based algorithm that are very simple and computationally efficient. And uh, also, very uh, its simplicity in implementation in the software. So this is the whole fra uh, whole uh, framework that uh, our flowchart that we have. Uh, we are going to explain a bit that how uh, our methodology works. So we collect the data, we normalize the raw data, and then we detect the data in a mm, threshold. So if it is cross a threshold then obviously you can see that this is uh, uh, that we have to check what type of vehicle it is and we record the data in that in a detection window so you have a window and then after recording that data we extract the features so what kind of features it has and then uh, we use the uh, basically decision tree model to classify the vehicle so i'm going to go over all these steps uh, uh, right now, little by little, to give you some idea how does it work. Okay, so uh, I was talking about the magnetic signature. So this is what the magnetic signature look like in a 2D plane. So in a, in a time series, and here is the magnetic field in the different channel. Now this sensor that we are using has like three axes. So for example, uh, if a car uh, running, for example, in this direction, so this is the x axis, and this is y axis, and this is z. So it basically provides you the magnetic signature in three different axes. So this is what it looked like in three different axes. Now, 
Uh, to make it uh, a bit normalized, we, uh, we normalize this uh, basically uh, by adaptive baseline. So we try to basically, uh, here also you can try to remove the noise because it will be not as clean as what you see here. There will be some uh, noise from the environment, so you have to remove the noise from the data. And then once you uh, remove the noise and adapt the baseline, and then uh, whenever there is a vehicle, it will obviously cross the threshold here. So for example, here is a simple uh, threshold that we have, for example, 100. So the magnitude of the magnetic field changes is 100. If there is a vehicle, obviously it will cross that threshold. So that's at that time we'll record. So here, uh, if it is crosses 100, then at this window, will record the magnetic signature. So how the magnetic signature look like, and then we are going to be, uh, we are going to analyze it. Now, uh, how the machine learning algorithm works here. So once you collect the data, you do a bit of signal processing here. So signal processing, normally uh, you could use many interesting signal processing function, but you have to un understand once again the computational uh, uh, capability of this node. Now, if you like to do an FFT here, fast Fourier transform, in this node, this node will die pretty soon. So we like to use a simple uh, signal processing function, like mean, max, mean, uh, and range. So this sort of uh, function, which is easy to compute. Because if you do more computation, as I said, that uh, Professor Giuliano said that it will be implanted underneath the pavement, and there is a better issue. If you use too much computation, then it will die pretty soon, and then we have to reach, uh, dig again, change the battery. So we need to make sure that we are using every uh, point of juice in a, in a proper way, in an in a efficient way. So the function, for example, this, so we, we don't need to use the heavy computation function. The, uh, the challenge is that, can you, we still classify the vehicle by using these simple functions? Now, uh, as I explained that we have three axes, okay? So now uh, we have two, uh, three axes, if you just basically use these four function in three axes, ultimately uh, you will have uh, uh, 12 unique features. So for example, uh, that's basically what we have in three different axis data. And these are the 12 feature that we computed uh, on three axis for this, uh, uh, this for example, uh, four feature mean, max, uh, mean range, okay? So, so this is what it look like, for example, the uh, signal processing data. So the straight lines that are basically signal processing values and the uh, magnetic signature that you can see in X, Y, Z uh, are this. Now, um, so this is basically, uh, uh, now these are two cars that we have. They are basically almost the same size. So for example, you can see that this is a, I mean, uh, uh, similar size of car, but you can see that magnetic signature is different. A, a bit, I mean, you can see from this curve, they are not same. So now, if the magnetic signature is not same, obviously the signal processing function value will be not same, because they will be also different. So that's basically what we try to do. So uh, now, <coughs> to uh, understand the, how to use these features, you need to make a decision tree, okay? So uh, we use a tool which is called Weka, and it was developed by University of Hokkaido. <coughs> and that use a very familiar decision tree learning algorithm which is called J48. So J48 or ID3 is a class of uh, um, uh, algorithm uh, developed by a very famous machine learning algorithm uh, person, so it's John Quinlan, and uh, this is the implementation of his C45 or ID3 algorithm. So uh, this is the freely available tools that you can uh, download it and you can use it. So what it does, it take the data 
and it tell you which feature you can use to uh, uh, for the classification. So we have 12 features that we uh, that our candidate. Are we going to use 12 of them? That's too much. So we like to use as less feature as possible, and we like to do as high classification possible, isn't it? So less number of feature, high number of accuracy. That's basically the goal. So this tool help you to give some light on that, that what, if you choose these uh, features, what will be the uh, accuracy rate? How accurately you can uh, classify different, uh, um, f uh, different, uh, different uh, vehicles. So let's assume that we have selected four uh, features and then uh, it says that this will be the algorithm it look like. I mean, it's very hard to understand from here. I have better picture in the next slide. But the, he, the reason I'm, I'm showing it here, uh, it shows the accuracy of the uh, classification. So around 98.85. So it can, if you have these four features, you just take out of 12, only four features, which is range Z. So you compute Z uh, range in the Z dimension. You compute max in x dimension. You compute uh, a mean in y dimension, y, y dimension, uh, and so on. So in, by using this feature, only this four feature, we can uh, have 98% of accuracy. So in this, in this seven, for these seven vehicles, that we can classify them very correctly. So now, this is the, uh, I mean, one of the three it look like. And so this is what we get in our software. And then we have to implement it in here. So we implement it here. It will do exactly the same thing. Uh, so uh, the uh, uh, decision tree that you can see here uh, that uh, use at first range Z, max X, and mean Y, and, and so on. So these are the four feature it takes. And you can see on the leaf of this, v, uh, of this tree are all the vehicles that we have. So we have seven vehicles. The leaves are basically the vehicles. So uh, I mean the green car, die cast car, green car, big cars, buggy car, and so on. So we can clearly uh, basically uh, distinguish them. Now, how does they do it? So how does basically ID3 uh, do this? So it's I'm not going to uh, go in depth, but it's basically information gain. So it checks uh, the, the entropy and see that if I compute this function, what is how I can divide this, uh, this classification almost equivalent uh, side. So left side and right side. Uh, at the major split. And then it looks the next one to have the major split and so on and so on. So uh, we have a paper that we have published recently. If you are interested, I can basically share it and you will have more details of, of this uh, classification method. Now, we have 12 features. Now, as I told you that we don't like to use 12 of them. So the brute force method is that let's have two features, three features four feature and see how much accurately they can classify these seven vehicles, isn't it? So this is what we are, we are doing. So uh, for example, we have 12, week, uh, 12 of uh, um, uh, the set. We have maximum this short of uh, uh, feature that you could have, but we will start with two, three, and four. So this is the result that I'm, 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 I would like to share with you. So forget about the red and black right now. We, I'll explain a bit later what does that mean. But right now, you can see that with two features, two features with all this combination, the accuracy is somewhat 91 to 94%. So only just using two features, you can accurately determine 91 to 94% which car it is, even for this small car. Now, if you increase the features, obviously you'll be able to more accuracy, isn't it? That's what we can see here. So if you use three features, uh, this is the, these are the combination of features that you have to use, then we can see that we can go as high as 98% of accuracy. 
Okay, so if you use four feature, we can go around 98. Uh, so it was uh, at the 98 plus something, so it's 99. So this is the best uh, we can we can get. So what is the red part? So uh, red part is that some features are not that good. Uh, the, the good is that uh, the mean x here we we find it out later that has a cliffing effect. So it's not that uh, you have this uh, result and you just uh, blindly implement it and it put it to, uh, into the uh, hardware. So we find it out that mean x has a clipping issue. And the, so that's why when we uh, basically actually uh, tested it, we find it out with the mean x, uh, the accuracy should be 98%, but in reality it is 90%. So in the left hand side, you can see the simulation result. That simulation is showing how accurate it should be. And in the, here is the actual wall that how accurate it is when we basically implement it. So you can see the numbers are somewhat very clear, I mean close to each other, uh, except this one, as I said, that mean uh, X is a not a good feature to take because it has some clipping issue. Okay, so now um, I don't know how much time I have, uh, so I'm going to move to the another topic. So this is what we have discussed so far, is designing a system that can classify the vehicles. Now, the second thing is that uh, we are using a system that doesn't have direct power supply. So it uses only the battery supply. Okay, so now we have to basically see an alternative way to uh, uh, energy scavenging so that it can last uh, year after year. We don't have to dig the hole again to replace the batteries. So, uh, so energy scavenging, what we try to do is uh, by using piezoelectric sensors. So by using the piezoelectric sensor, which basically convert mechanical pressure into the energy, into electrical energy. So that's the purpose of the uh, of the uh, piezoelectric sensors. So, um, so here, for example, these are the energy source. It could be, I mean, for the surface road, it could be even uh, pedestrian, and also the cars. And then we convert this piezoelectric sensor, convert this mechanical energy into the electrical energy, and afterwards it goes to the ADC and the voltage regulator and then it recharges the battery. So I'm not going to basically very in depth of this uh, uh, whole thing. Just like to show what we have tried so far. So this is one of uh, my student group. They try to build a system which has you know, say two padding. So this is a kind of a side view. This is inside of this, uh, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, system. We have six. Uh, uh, piezoelectric sensor, and this is what you see at the top of this. Uh, uh, of this. So, I mean, w these sensors are pretty uh, inexpensive. They are, they are expensive version, iPhone version also, which is uh, quite expensive. Uh, but they are much efficient compared to this. So, um, so what you can see that the design that we come up with uh, if we can have stack of sensors and then you can just implant it uh, on the road, then it is enough, this system is enough to basically produce the power for the, for the, uh, uh, for this, uh, for the design system. So, uh, I mean, uh, just to give you a very um, simple answer, the how long it takes. Okay, so I mean, if we have a two AA rechargeable battery, it could be recharged in 10 or 12 hours. It's just sitting on this uh, road. So big are passing and it will tap the power. And that's enough for, for example, you know, once you recharge it, it's good for a, uh, for a month or so. So it, it doesn't take that much of time to, uh, to have it and uh, uh, build it that can run year after year. So. Uh, more or less, I'm, the, I'm basically at the end of my uh, talk, so I would like to basically hand over it, uh, uh, little uh, things that I developed to all of you, if you just like to, I mean, see what I have done, with, not uh, I have done, I mean, my student has done. So, I mean, this is the system that will uh, we'll try to basically, we are in the phase of uh, miniaturization, miniaturize it in a, in a quarter. So uh, right now it is around 
two in two and a half inch to one in, one and a half and three quarters so which is basically we design it as a as a uh, you know uh, the size of the two, uh, double a battery pack so it's it's a, it's, it's a very small package so here is the radio that you can see and if you can see it here the main thing here is a microprocessor here this is a microprocessor and this is the sensor so this is the sensor part. So I mean, all these other things are basically, I mean, to just to make this system work. So uh, just a, for example, two things, and this is the, basically the antenna that uh, we, uh, we need to have to build a system. OK, so final marks, uh, remarks here. The system described in this presentation can replace, uh, I mean, gigantic uh, inductive loop and uh, with, uh, uh, you know, we have to have, uh, it can maintain uh, vehicle detection, it has the vehicle detection capability, and uh, it has the vehicle classification capability, that's what I explained uh, so far. It has low power consumption and low physical uh, area of utilization, and uh, many classifiers can be used at high accuracy rates compared to the method utilizing solely uh, novel features. So these are the uh, several publications. I mean, we are just working one year uh, on this. So recently we had uh, we had two, uh, one in the Matrans conference and one, another in in the IT Poly conference. We have presented our work, and we are hoping to basically extend the work in future to uh, make it more uh, robust. So that's all for um, from me. Uh, and uh, I would love to have some question if you have. Yes, please. Uh, what, uh, what temperature range of this sensor? Because I, I, I'm wondering if we use this in South California and we barely enter the pavement. When this, when, when, when this summer we got a lot of sunshine, can such a sophisticated device works smoothly in this kind of extreme temperature? Um, to be very honest with you, uh, we have not, uh, uh, I mean, tested the temperature uh, effect on these sensors. Uh, I mean, especially whether it can, uh, I mean, uh, uh, it can basically bear that kind of temperature. But my uh, assumption is that since it will be sealed box, so it will be in a sealed box underneath the pavement, uh, uh, let's say it will be around a feet or half feet from the ground. So um, high temperature will not affect there. The idea of this being more than just a sensor, but a device that can receive communication as well. And there's a lot of demand for other types of, of data in the transportation planning work that we do. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I think about whenever I look at my wife or my client, like I can sense that they're there, but I don't know what they're thinking unless I communicate with them. And you know, similar in, in the transportation field, if I can see a bus, I can detect that it's a bus, but do I know how many people are on board the bus? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's onboard passenger counting systems mm -hmm. that could send a signal so, to absolutely. something like That's, this. Absolutely. And we already have it with transponders for emergency vehicles mm -hmm. that are sending a signal to, to the traffic signal or the buses that are mm -hmm. sending a signal saying, I am a bus, mm -hmm. but if we can have Something yes. that's smart like this, and this is smarter than an inductive loop, mm -hmm. that could also detect that information, mm -hmm. it would be incredibly useful. And it, it seems like we would almost only need to have like ISO standards for the way that transportation data mm -hmm. is transmitted so that you could pick up, you know, if I put a little, little sticker on my vehicle registration, it could have an RFID that says this is a Nissan Versa. Absolutely. Now you all know that I drive. <laughs> and, and it'll send it to the sensor, and then you can calculate vehicle emissions and yeah. so the, I, I'm, I'm excited about this because it's smarter than an inductive loop but I hope it can do a lot more absolutely. than what absolutely. an inductive loop absolutely. can do. I, I completely agree with you. So initial intention is to basically do the uh, vehicle classification so that's what we are, are trying to do. But uh, it's a system that has a couple of things. It, it can have sensor, it has a radio, it has a microprocessor. Meaning is that you can do whatever you think uh, on, on that capability. So if you have the power, first of all, you have the power. I mean, if you can basically enhance the muscle of the microprocessor, so you can basically make it a bit, because microprocessor has become very small and very strong right now in a small package. And the thing is that not only that, it comes with a SOC, system on chip. So right now, it's coming with the radio inside. 
So the RF, wireless communication is also inside. So meaning is that, I mean, absolutely you can, absolutely. Yeah. And then of course the missing piece, and I can mostly like in pedestrian planning, is it, you know, can it do the same with, with pedestrian, in, in things that aren't putting off a big magnetic field. I might yeah. put off a magnetic field, but I don't know if this is gonna. Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's basically the uh, disadvantage here. So I mean, uh, as I said, that it can detect the metallic objects. So this sensor is developed for that purpose. So now, obviously, for example, there are other sensors, for example, that could be used for the penetration. Uh, so for example, uh, we fear the pressure. So when they, uh, they walk, they at least push some pressure on the, on the ground. So there could be another sensor that could uh, detect that. Yeah, so that detect that. So this sensor that I'm using is designed to uh, detect the ferocious material. So meaning is that you know the, that has metal. But obviously, I mean, you could integrate more sensors here in this system and can do uh, like you know penetration. Who uh, who doesn't have that kind of uh, material to basically, and you can do that. So who, um, what stakeholders are you targeting in order to implement? So um, this was this research was funded by Matrans and also Caltrans. So uh, obviously Caltrans is a state agency, so they're using I mean the uh, old uh, systems, uh, inductive loops, and so on. So they like to see the technology of it. So new technology that they can embrace. Now uh, I talked with uh, uh, the uh, Caltrans. So one of the district in, uh, especially in the uh, um, Northern California, they're using uh, this sort of devices from a commercial company, but uh, not uh, you know, statewide. So not all of uh, the uh, district are using the same component. But this is kind of a, a feature that we have to. We have to basically, things are getting, uh, the sensor are becoming small. So that's what uh, we like to see, smarter systems. Uh, compared to the old uh, inductive loop. Lots of good questions. One more. So I'm not an engineer or a uh, planning student. I should have a little demonstration. Mm -hmm. um, so this may be a silly question. Um, but given, <coughs> and it's more just the question about application, mm -hmm. um, given the way the sensors are, are set up, is there a way of seeing, like if there was an accident, if the way cars actually move and crash into each other, and the way, and like be able to better lay out, say, an accident scene in terms of saying who was at fault in that kind of thing, mm -hmm. and another application. Could be, could be. I mean, if you have, uh, for example, implanted, for example, uh, more, uh, you know, uh, in, in, a, uh, in a smaller distance apart, then you can see the magnetic signature, how they are basically moving. Not only the, for example, one signature, you can have multiple signatures if you basically implant it very, <coughs> sorry, closely to each other. In that cases, if you have a smart algorithm that can see that, I mean, how this uh, accident happened. Mm -hmm. who, who, who was basically, I mean, how, uh, how the basically the root of this, of this car, so how, how it was divided and so on. Obviously, it, there is a possibility. If you could uh, implant more of them and have an algorithm, uh, a smart algorithm that can. Uh, and that's the beauty of really cheap and tiny sensors. Because you, you, are, you, you know, many of you are thinking about how if we just sort of massively deploy something like this, you, know, you get all kinds of information.